The Caribbean Leadership Project is a seven-year initiative funded by the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. The project supports the leadership and economic development training needs of regional and national public sectors in 12 CARICOM countries. The purpose of the Caribbean Leadership Project is to strengthen the capacity of future leaders in the region to contribute more effectively to Caribbean integration and economic growth, as well as support gender-sensitive public sector reform. Hello, I'm Ian Boyne, and for the next hour, we will focus specifically on the intricate role of the permanent secretary in the Caribbean. We are privileged to have with us one of the most distinguished public servants in the Caribbean, Dr. the Honorable Carlton Davis, who is the former head of the Jamaican Civil Service, uh, former cabinet secretary, and presently serves as special advisor to Jamaican Prime Minister, the most honorable Portia Simpson Miller. For the next hour, we will draw on the expertise of Dr. Davis and hopefully clarify issues to do with the role and function of the permanent secretary. Dr. Davis, so good to, to have you um, <laughs> in studio and on, on set. Let us first begin by talking about your own experience in the public sector. This spans uh, several decades. That's right. I started out in the scientific arena at the Scientific Research Council, a brief stint at the Department of Mines, and I was recruited into the bauxite negotiating team in late 1973, just when we were preparing for the negotiations with the bauxite and alumina companies for um, new taxation bases and so on. Then uh, I moved into the Jamaica Bauxite Institute, which was created in 1976. And I had an association with that institution in various capacities, executive director, executive chairman, chairman for all of 31 years. Mm -hmm. Then sometime along the way, I was um, asked by Mr. Manley first, before he left office, to be cabinet secretary and head of the public service. But I thought I was doing just fine at the Bauxite Institute, and I was made chairman of the Housing Trust, a subject of which I knew very little, but I learned as I went along. And I said it wasn't quite the time to do it. Mr. Manley was, of course, disappointed, because as you would be aware, we were very good friends. Mm -hmm. But shortly after that, mis when Mr. Patterson succeeded Mr. Manley, the pressure was put on me again. And my wife said, you know, as good as you think you are, it is not wise to say no to your political leaders too often. Yes. So I took the job as cabinet secretary and head of the civil service. That's the early 90s. In 1993. 93. And I held that post for 15 years before I retired. Yeah. And then with Mrs. Simpson Miller's return to office, mm -hmm. I was asked to be a special advisor. Yes. So here am I. And you served as cabinet secretary on the different political administrations. All told, I have served five prime ministers. Five prime ministers. In a, in a capacity in which I actually talked to them directly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Michael Manley, Mr. Edward Siaga, Mr. P.J. Patterson, Mrs. Portia Simpson Miller, and Mr. Bruce Golden. I don't think, frankly, I doubt if there has been any public servant in Jamaica's history to have done that yes. in a direct way yes. in, in which the person actually knows you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally uh, have heard two uh, prime ministers of the Jamaica Labor Party administration uh, speak so glowingly about you, about your impartiality about your professionalism and your dedication to the country. How, how does a, a public servant, a permanent secretary, attain that kind of status, especially in a politically polarized environment like Jamaica? Well, I've said it to, um, to, to people that um, whether it is politics or religion or whatever, people have their points of view. But overall, you should be a professional just like what you would expect from a doctor mm -hmm. or a lawyer, that it doesn't matter what your politics or what your 
religion is, that that person should give you the best advice. And I have taken that as a personal philosophy. So when Mr. Siaga came into office in 1980, it was a time of charged political of and ideological divisions. Yes. And if you carried a certain name, there was an automatic expectation that that's where you belonged. And that was correct. But I took the view that bauxite and alumina were too important for Jamaica's development and that I should lead, act and lead my staff as professionals to serve whoever was government. And I think that's one of the reasons why they, they say, you know, nice things. Yes. We're going to come back to that issue of impartiality in the, in the public sector. But first, let us look at the, at the, the, the whole evolution of the role of the permanent secretary. Situate that um, position uh, for us within the Westminster system. Well, it started in the 1830s, which was a decade of great um, reform developments. Abolition of slavery, 1834, 1838. Mm -hmm. um, the reform, the Great Reform Act in the United Kingdom. And um, under Earl Grey, he of the tea, under his ministry, he invited Sir John Barrow, who was called Secretary of the Admiralty, mm -hmm. an important um, division of the British Public Service then, to stay on establishing the principle that a public servant continues to serve the, the government regardless of who forms the government. Mm -hmm. And then later in Sir John Barrow's administration, he was called permanent secretary. And we have more or less adopted that term. In Canada, they call it deputy ministers. And some, some in Belize, for example, and in New Zealand, we're using a more new public management term, CEOs, chief executive officers. Mm -hmm. So that's how it evolved. Yes. And what was the relationship uh, then, and how was the relationship evolved between the permanent secretary and the minister? Well, you know, the British is one of three countries without uh, a written constitution for the most part. Yes. New Zealand and um, Israel are the other two. And so the British were able to establish more by, by tradition the way things operated. We have institutionalized us, ours in the Constitution or in specific laws oh. so we to, to try to define that role. But it's very vague. Let me just read you what the Jamaican Constitution says about it. Section 93.1. Where any minister has been charged with responsibility for a subject or department of government, he shall exercise general direction and control over the work relating to that subject or over that department. And Subject as aforesaid to such direction and control, the aforesaid work and department shall be under the supervision of a permanent secretary. That's not the world's most clearest <laughs> definition, <laughs> expression of the roles of each. So what you have to do is to use other practices, may I say best practices, how do you balance this role of general direction and control and subject to this general direction and control supervision in the day-to-day -day responsibilities. And that is one of the things that we have evolved over time. Who does what? Some specific laws uh, make it clear that permanent secretaries are respon responsible. They are the accounting officers, mm -hmm. for example. So a minister does not get involved in the, shall we say, the bookkeeping of the ministry specific laws like in Jamaica, the Financial Administration and Audit Act and the other Caribbean territories have their um, similar legislation. So there are specific things which fall under the responsibility of a permanent secretary. A permanent secretary is the one who would appear in parliament before the committees to defend the performance of his department or ministry. Mm -hmm. Is there much similarity throughout the Caribbean in uh, the rules and functions of uh, permanent secretaries? Or would we find significant differences in law 
in terms of the 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 definition of the, of the permanent secretary and uh, the the delegation of his powers, with the exception of Guyana, um, which has um, developed its own variety okay. of the Westminster system. In fact, I don't even know if you would describe its variety in terms of the Westminster system mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And Belize, latterly, Belize has introduced the concept of a CEO instead of a permanent secretary. But interestingly, a, a CEO that goes with, that is appointed by the incoming government and goes with it. And I have made the comment. And goes with it. And goes with it. I have made the comment that that is, in effect, a parliamentary secretary without being a member of parliament. Yes. In the case of the rest of the Caribbean, more or less mm -hmm. follow the same pattern. The constitutions of the 1960s for Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago set the pattern which um, has been followed by the other um, Commonwealth Caribbean countries. Even though there has been an, an evolved tradition of the relationship and the interface between the permanent secretary and the political administration, I'm sure there are areas of tension yes. and indeed areas of ambiguity. Yes, tensions would arise in policy. Um, you know, a lot of policies stem from manifestos. And manifestos are not always at all times, let me put it like that, the most thought through. <laughs> of expression <laughs> of, yes. our, of our way and very often yeah. manifestos are written before people have a good idea of what the budgetary constraints oh, are. So you have that in which some things may be underformed and, and, and that has to be developed. There may be instances where a permanent secretary may believe a policy is just dead wrong is just not going mm -hmm. to spin, as mm -hmm. they say. And a permanent secretary has to exercise the discipline that the political directorate is the one authorized by the body politic uh -huh. to determine what its policies are. And that if a permanent secretary disagrees with those policies, he or she should express the disagreement and the basis for the disagreements, and even s suggest alternative ways. But if the government decides that it's going to follow through with the policy, it is the duty of the permanent secretary to go along with that. If the permanent secretary feels it is a matter of such great moment, then he or she may elect to seek a transfer to some other department where he or she may be more comfortable, or in extremis, leave the government. That is, that is it. But that's the political, that's the constitutional framework in which we operate. So that can be an area of tension. Another area of tension can be the matter of personnel. The way we have it, the Public Service Commission is the authority which recommends for appointment the various officers in the public service. Now, everybody knows ministers may have their own people whom they would wish to have with them. Now, in our more rigid constitutional framework, the degrees of freedom are, are not many for a minister. In Canada or in, in, in the United Kingdom, the Prime Minister and has a fair amount of flexibility. In fact, the Prime Minister of Canada has a huge, in fact, what is called the Office of the Prime Minister in Canada is not a, is not a civil service office. It is a, really an advisory office of his own personal advisors. Mm -hmm. In our own situation, this is a balancing act which a permanent secretary, working with the Public Service Commission, working with the Minister, was try to arrive at something which is, is fair. We are under scrutiny all the time, as you are aware. We can't just simply um, appoint people without a basis for doing so. And that is an area of tension. 
Another area of tension is over expenditure. <laughs> a minister may feel, say, a trip abroad, you know, to, to look at the um, Colosseum in Rome uh, <laughs> as a sort of a, you know, uh, attend, while well attending a meeting of the FAO, the <laughs> Food and Agricultural <laughs> Organization, the Permanent Secretary may feel that, A, the trip is not really justified, mm -hmm. and B, the, money, the resources are not there. And that can be a serious area of tension. But here again, a Permanent Secretary has to try to, A, avoid not standing on ceremony. And some do. Some do. Some issues are not that black and white, and that you can give the benefit of the, the doubt to a minister. Mm -hmm. If the minister is adamant and, y and you feel, the permanent secretary feels that this ought not to be done, then the minister, the permanent secretary should look, certainly when I served as cabinet secretary, many permanent secretaries would come to me with that sort of issue. And I would determine whether I intervene directly with the minister or, if necessary, go to the prime minister myself as a means of arriving at a resolution short of, 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 of a conflict. So, so the permanent secretaries had uh, you as, as a means um, through, through whom certain issues could be carried that's upstream. Right. That's right. And, and the model we have adopted follows the United Kingdom and the, um, and the Canadian, in which a cabinet secretary is sort of primus inter Paris. Oh. And with a relationship to the prime minister that gives it some more authority than otherwise would have been the case. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, that, that protects the permanent um, secretary, yes. um, adds to his, his leverage. That's right. With vis-a-vis -vis his, own, his own minister. Right. And that is one of the reasons why a strong and effective permanent secretary's board can be an important part of governance. Um, I certainly established one when I was there, and I gather this has been carried on by my my successor, Ambassador Douglas Saunders, where permanent secretaries can bring problems to the board and have these problems discussed and a decision taken. So there are means that a permanent secretary can and should use to assist him or her in managing situations that might be more difficult than um, he or she would have wished. Yes. And which means that the, the, the cabinet secretary he, himself or herself has to have the kind of, 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 of statue and, and commanding authority to be able to be respected by the prime minister. Absolutely. And I, and I believe that it is something that you have to, it, it, it doesn't come because you're named. <laughs> it comes because you have developed and you know, you, you win the confidence whether you appear in Parliament or whether you appear before the media mm -hmm. or whether you give speeches before various, um, you know, various groups. Mm -hmm. You establish an authority and a knowledge, and that itself um, enhances your position to, to exercise, to do your job. Good. More issues to ex explore. We take a break at this uh, point. We are looking at the roles and functions of the permanent secretary in the, in, the, in the Caribbean, the interface between the permanent secretary and the political administration, the kinds of, of skills which are needed in a permanent secretary. And we're speaking to uh, one of the most distinguished uh, Caribbean public servants, a former cabinet secretary, Ambassador Dr. Carlton Davis. We take a break, but we'll be right back.
welcome back. We continue our discussion on the roles and responsibilities of the Permanent Secretary. We have with us Dr. the Honorable Carlton Davis, former Cabinet Secretary, Head of the Jamaican Public Service, and himself a highly distinguished public servant with considerable experience in, in the public service, uh, someone who, who headed the Jamaican Public Service, interacted with the uh, permanent secretaries who worked under him. He's explaining to us the roles and critical functions of the permanent secretary. Um, uh, Ambassador Davis, the issue of formulation of policy, implementation of policy vis-a-vis -vis the permanent secretary and the minister. Let's talk about that. Well, policy. The, 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 the policy is one of the main functions of government. Policy can be through law, policy can be through projects, policy can be through various means, mm -hmm. executive actions. A permanent secretary has got to be both ministers and permanent secretaries, but mi permanent secretaries in particular have to be familiar with the policy process. And basically, you can make the process as many points as you wish, but the basic points are formulation, implementation, monitoring, and evaluating. In formulation, as I was saying earlier, a minister might come with an idea, like a national health insurance scheme, as we did sometime in the 1990s. And in its formulation, a permanent secretary should be very much involved, the economics, the logistics, the, the, the groups which will benefit, and so on. And that's an important thing. Now, in the final analysis, you give your advice. In the final analysis, the cabinet or the, the, the minister is going to say, this is the way we go. You then get to the implementation stage, and here, the role of the permanent secretary is, is much more important in the sense that he or she has to see to the thing being put on the ground. Say it's a basic school or it's a road to make sure that things are being done within budget and on a timely basis that the targeted groups, for example, you may be targeting employment of certain types of people mm -hmm. and so on. You may have certain gender issues. You may want, to, I remember once in the National Housing Trust, we made it a policy that we must see more women in the construction industry doing certain things. A permanent secretary must see to that. Then you come to the important monitoring and evaluation. Now, the monitoring is really so, sort of looking at benchmarks, but evaluation, which is much more important, which may involve some shifts uh, or even major changes. So that this is an area in which a permanent secretary has got to work closely with the minister to ensure that the policy process is carried out as efficiently as possible. Now, to get a policy going, there is a thing called cabinet submission, which, mm -hmm. with which you are familiar. Yes. In some places, they call it memorandum. A permanent secretary must be able to oversee or himself or herself write the submission in a manner that is in English, um, <laughs> so that would be speak, um, is concise, puts the issues, people, I mean, there is this anatomy of reading which we all know about, yes. but so you, you've got to be concise, put the issues down, what it is. Mm -hmm. You want to capture the main points. Cap capture the main points. Show the consultations that you have undertaken. A very good cabinet submission can win the day, because when the minister looks at it, he or she sees that it is well prepared. So that's one aspect. There is another aspect: the aspect of consultation. And all this work is going on before the cabinet room. In fact, one of the criticisms made of cabinets. Um, in the Caribbean, the Commonwealth Caribbean, is that the meetings tend to be eternal. And one of the reasons why they are eternal is that one, 
there's, a, there's too much micromanagement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes settled policies are brought back to cabinet and, and that takes a lot of time. But m very importantly, not enough preparation and consultations have been done. Now these can be done formally within cabinet committees or informally in which you meet with the other departments that are associated with the project. They may be environmental, they may be issues of the supply of water, whatever it is. So all of this is a part of the policy process. A permanent secretary should also have the responsibility of making sure that they, the correct stakeholders are consulted in advance. Mm -hmm. um, we know, for example, in some issues, you may want to preempt expected attacks True. by bringing the people Absolutely. in early. For example, environmental, environmental yes. removing squatters mm -hmm. from a watershed area. Mm -hmm. um, some of your colleagues take pleasure in, in getting the cameras, cameras here, showing you how wicked, wicked, yes. wicked government is moving showing people, are people uh, off awakening land. them at early hours. Yes. Now, consultations would indicate that if the people remain there, it will affect erosion, mm -hmm. it will affect the ground and, and um, surface water, yes. it may affect the coral reefs. I am just showing yes. all those sort of things. Now, at it least you, other right, and you would have preempted mm -hmm. some of the problems. So a permanent secretary has that sort of a role, that he must, or she, he or she must consult with the minister and bring the minister in as necessary in the process. So it is, one of the, it is one of the three important generic functions of a permanent secretary, policy advice and policy management. Though that's a very important function. Uh, and there has to be a thoroughness that the permanent secretary brings to his, his job. Uh, his cannot be just a narrow focus. Absolutely. But, but he has to think strategically. Absolutely. And that is, and that is, and that is, and that is where I come into my favorite um, areas, where a permanent secretary has to be so well prepared, not only in the specific, because there are hardly, um, I, there are very few islands and tie of themselves. Okay? So if you're doing a hotel project, yeah. it's not just hotel construction. Water, the environment, all sorts of other issues, and various stakeholders. And so a permanent secretary must be on top of these mm. sort of things. Mm and therefore read around issues, not just read about issues. Absolutely. So, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. We have to have a whole section where we talk about the, the, the skills and competencies of the permanent secretary. But this area that you touched on, which is the, the kind of cross-functional role that the permanent secretary must have, how the permanent secretary must bring together the disparate groups that have interests in a particular matter. How important is this? Because uh, if, if that is not done, when it goes to the cabinet as a whole, if there's not sufficient consultation and coordination, the, the idea being mooted might be killed there. So it's important to have that coordination, absolutely. that groundwork before. Absolutely, from many perspectives. One, we're operating in a less authoritarian order than in the past. You need to persuade. 50 years ago, you just simply say, Edict. this is it, yes. and that's it, and nobody complains. No. In fact, the newspapers just <laughs> faithfully report what you said. So that's, that's one thing. No, we have to get buy-in. Well, we see the issue, for example, of cigarette smoking. Everybody oh, yes. knows that cigarette smoking is a, is a harmful thing. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to be too bright it's to true. know that. Yet, you see the, yes. the issues which have arisen. Now, without being critical, it would appear that some things may not have been considered mm -hmm. as likely issues mm -hmm. prior to the announcement of the policy. Mm -hmm. Now that is an example where you have to try to see what are the issues that might arise. Implications. And then somebody might have seen then hotels are going to say, well, some of our people come here. Yeah. Well, it's like to, to have a policy against people bathing nude. Yes. Yeah? Some hotels are going to say, but it will close, uh, close my, my, my business down. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to think through these things and see to what extent you can solicit the views of the stakeholders 
and incorporate them before the policy is finished. Yes. Important issues to do with the roles and functions of the permanent secretary. That is the area we're looking at today under this Caribbean Leadership uh, Project interview. We take a break, but we'll be right back. <laughs> 